I'm Paul Levinson, and welcome to Light On, Light Through, episode 166, Opinions, Lies, and Polarization. Well, the new term, the spring term, has begun at Fordham University, and the other night I taught my first class online via Zoom of a course called Communication Ethics and the Public Sphere. So I thought I'd share an excerpt from that lecture with you here in this episode. The sound is pretty good this time, so here it is. The Light on Light Through podcast. So, for example, Trump getting thrown off Twitter. There are some people who say Twitter should have done that months ago. It's Twitter's fault to some extent that there was that attack on the Capitol. There are some people who say... We have to do something to control Twitter to make sure that Twitter acts more expeditiously in the future. There are obviously some people who say Twitter acted dictatorially and it violated Donald Trump's First Amendment rights when it threw him off Twitter. By the way, that argument is easily refuted Can anybody tell me why that argument is wrong? Just quickly. The argument that, okay, Patricia? Well, I was going to say because Twitter is a a privately owned company. Good, Patricia. That's completely right. That's exactly the point. The First Amendment to the Constitution says Congress shall make no law bridging freedom of speech or the press. It was extended through the 14th Amendment to not just apply to Congress and the federal government, but to apply to any government, including, by the way, a public university. Because if it's public, it means, you know, like City College of New York basically gets its money and exists as part of New York City or SUNY Stony Brook, part of New York State. Fordham University, by the way, is not violating any student's right when it says a student can or can't say this, because Fordham University is a private institution. We'll talk more about this later on the term. I think it's, in that case, Fordham might be violating the spirit of the First Amendment, but it's not violating the First Amendment per se. And so neither was Twitter. So that argument is pretty easily disposed of. But the point I'm making is just on that one action, which admittedly was a really you know, profound action, but just on that one action, you find a wide diversity of opinions, sometimes small differences, sometimes big differences, even among people who might politically feel the same way. So um, I actually wrote an article about this, you know, Twitter and Trump. And, you know, I was interviewed on a radio station. So I get like plenty of email about this. And most of my email is not from Trump supporters. It's from people who dislike Trump as much as I do, but they still strongly disagree with what, what my opinion is. But I think that's good. That's healthy. And that's why it's important that people need to express their opinions. But that's getting a little bit away from this question of lies. And by the way, in general, the First Amendment does protect the right of people to lie. The only exception is if somebody lies and that lie can lead to a person being killed or endanger the public health, that becomes then a situation where the First Amendment might not protect the right of a person to lie and endanger somebody else's life. But uh, that is a relatively rare exception. And one of the reasons why the First Amendment in general protects the right of people to lie is that people lie all the time. About, oh, I don't know, about seven or eight years ago, up here in White Plains, New York, I was called in to sit on a jury. 
So I wanted to get out of the jury. You know, who wants to sit on a jury? I mean, I'm public minded, but I didn't particularly feel like sitting on a jury. There's something called a voir dire, which is where uh, lawyers and sometimes the judge ask potential jurors questions. So the prosecution, and it was a criminal case in which police were testifying. The prosecution said to me, do you think it's possible for a police officer to lie? And I said, both truthfully, but also wanting to get off the case, are you kidding? Of course police officers lie. There's no human being on the face of this earth who hasn't lied. To be human is not only to err, you know, to err is to be human or to be human is to err. It's also to lie. Now, I don't know, you know, I can't get into a dog's mind, but I mean, I don't think dogs lie, right? I mean, they can be annoying, they can whine, but they usually, in fact, they're always doing that because they want something that they're not getting. They're not lying. They're not putting on an act. But human beings lie all the time. So I said that, and then the judge was so impressed with my answer, he made me four person of the jury. So that's what I got for telling the truth in that situation. But I think it is definitely the truth. Everybody lies. That's why the First Amendment would be a shambles if it said nobody can lie. But even though everybody lies, that doesn't mean that it's okay to lie. And it certainly doesn't mean that public officials can lie, nor does it mean that the media should lie. And one of the main things that we're going to be considering this class, in this course, in fact, that I'm going to be talking to you about, you may be researching other things, is this increasingly prominent role that lies have played and are playing in our public discourse. And this, by the way, gets into the notion of fake news, which we're also going to talk about. Fake news is not just the media making a mistake. And here again, humans make mistakes. To be human is to err, meaning there is not a human being on the face of this planet who hasn't made a mistake. We always make mistakes all the time. And the media are organizations in which human beings are working to get information out to the public. They make mistakes unintentionally all the time. Fake news, however, is not just a mistake. It's a deliberate attempt to deceive. So when Donald Trump claimed over and over again the media are fake news, what he was saying is not just that they were mistaken in how they covered him in their reports, but they were deliberately lying in order to stir up anger against Donald Trump. Now, when I say that everybody lies, and when I say that everyone distorts, I not only just mean every person or every politician, but this applies, and we're going to be looking into this in various examples I'm going to be talking to you about, the media distorting and not telling the truth. Now, there are different kinds of lies. We're going to be talking about this as well. There are lies of omission, and there are lies of commission. Anybody want to tell me what the difference is between those two kinds of lies? A lie of omission versus a lie of commission? Well, it means what those words mean. A lie of omission is you leave something out, so it's not the complete truth. A lie of commission is you say something that it might not only leave things out, but say things that are not true. And most of us, and most media engage in both. The New York Times has had for a very long time as one of its logos, you've all seen this, all the news that's fit to print. All the news that's fit to print. That's a pretty bold claim. 
that this newspaper somehow found all the news as fit to print and they're telling it to you, telling it to their reader. It's not only a bold claim, it's a lie. Because if you know even a little bit about newspapers, any of you work on the Fordham Observer or the Fordham Ram or any of the school newspapers, but if you've worked on a newspaper, you would know that what happens in a newspaper is an editor or an editorial board decides what stories the journalist will go out and report on. Then the editors and, or the editorial board will decide which stories to put into the paper and which stories not to put into the paper. So all the news that's fit to print, the New York Times. A more accurate, truthful logo would be all the news that we, a small band of editors here at the New York Times, deemed fit to print. But that doesn't scan as well as all the news that's fit to print. Have any of you heard of a newscaster by the name of Walter Cronkite? Who wants to tell me who Walter Cronkite is? Colleen, you raised your hand. Who is Walter Cronkite? Um, he was an old uh, journalist and like broadcaster in the 70s. Um, when he earned his fame by being just like really trustful. And I think his nickname was like America's uncle or something. I can't remember what it was or something like that. <laughs> That's good. Walter would be happy that you remembered so much about him. By the way, he wasn't old when he started. But obviously, if we look back on him now, he's old. Walter Cronkite was known for a lot of different things. One of the things he was known for, and you're right, Colleen, he was a, a very trusted person. In fact, in a Gallup poll in the 1970s, Walter Cronkite was found to be by the American people the most trusted person in America. A person who did the CBS Evening News. He had a great sounding voice. People loved him. They named a school of journalism after Walter Cronkite out in Arizona, the Cronkite School of Journalism. Walter Cronkite used to end each of his newscasts on the CBS Evening News. He would look into the camera and say, and that's the way it is, just like that. And that's the way it is. And then the credits would start rolling and you'd see some names on the screen and it would go into a series of commercials and you would get the next program on CBS TV. And that's the way it is. Now, I always uh, liked Walter. I sort of trusted him too, you know. I was much younger then. I was much more naive. And I didn't realize until later that actually Walter Cronkite was not telling the truth when he said that. And that's the way it is. I don't think so. What really was the case with the news that Walter Cronkite reported on the CBS Evening News 30-minute program, basically the editors at CBS News decided that that would be put on the show, just like the New York Times. Not all the news that's fit to print. All the news that the New York Times thought you should see. There's a lot of news they don't print. And the same is true with Walter Cronkite. A truthful ending to his show would have been, and that's the way a small group of editors here at CBS TV thought you should think it is. But again, that doesn't really scan, right? You, you know, it's much better to say, and that's the way it is. So you have a similar thing in both cases. And the New York Times is still the newspaper of record. Walter Cronkite back then was the most trusted man in America. But in both those cases, it was a lie of commission to some extent, but it was a lie of omission more than anything else because it left out a very important part of how the news got into the newscast with Walter Cronkite and how the news got into the pages of the New York Times. 
Some people think, and we're going to consider this throughout this term as well, and Cecilia Bach's book on lying is a good place to read more about this. Some people think that lies of commission are worse than lies of omission, because at least a lie of omission isn't making anything up. It's leaving part of the truth out, but what it's saying is true insofar as there's not a lie in that. But I don't know about that. I think each person has to think for him or herself which they find more objectionable or are both objectionable for different reasons. I think most people feel that if you're having a conversation with somebody, if you're looking for information about what happened in a situation, And whoever you're talking to or whoever put together that news that you are reading, if they leave something crucial out, that that's a pretty serious thing, that lie of omission. By the way, also we'll throw in something else. You've all heard of the expression, a white lie. What's a white lie? Anybody want to give the class a definition of a white lie? Yes, Eugene. It's like a a little lie that's considered harmless. Uh, It is considered harmless, but it's even more than that. It's more than harmless, a white lie. It is, anybody? Okay, Becky? Is it like a lie that you're telling like for a good reason or like to protect somebody? That's right, yes. So we can think of all kinds of of examples of white lies. You know, the example that's often used by ethicists. I just read today, uh, and I, I, frankly, I was not a fan of the show, but it's a horrible story. The guy who played Screech in um, one of these television sitcoms from like 20 years ago, tragically, his death was announced today. He died of lung cancer. And... But like the really, you know, I mean, in this age of COVID, you know, there are all kinds of tragedies. This is like an equivalent tragedy. He basically was just diagnosed like three or four weeks ago. He went into the hospital, was having, you know, coughing or something. He thought it was COVID. He was diagnosed with a very aggressive form of lung cancer. He's dead a few weeks later. So there's an ethical position that, hey, if you only have three weeks left to live, Would you like to know that you only have three weeks left to live? So there's an argument. Yeah, you know, you should know because there might be things that you want to do. But there's also the argument, you're certainly not going to be happy for those three weeks, right? So in other words, maybe the ethical thing to do is to lie and tell the person, yeah, you know, you have a cough. Don't worry, it'll get better. I'm going to give you this medication. Go out and have a good time. And then, you know, the person dies, but they never know that they only have three weeks left to live. So that's an example of a white lie. There are a lot of white lies that are not life and death situations. Let's say, again, we're finally out of this COVID age. I think we will be in the next year. You know, the vaccines are coming in. They'll have some protection against the new mutations. They won't be able to reproduce that fast because fewer and fewer people will have COVID. So I think there is light at the end of the tunnel. So let's say sometime in the future, you're walking down the street and you see your girlfriend's boyfriend walking in a very romantic way with another girl. So if you tell your girlfriend, which probably most people would, you're you're certainly going to cause your girlfriend a lot of grief, right? She's not going to be happy to hear that a boyfriend is walking with another girl in a romantic way. So that also is like a classic case of maybe the best thing is to have like a white lie of omission. You know, you, you, you don't say that maybe things will work out and you can argue well but the problem with that is then you know your girlfriend has no heads up this guy will probably break her heart anyway so the right thing to do is to tell her the reason why i'm mentioning all these things is let's get back again to trump and what he was saying about covid during his presidency right he starts off by saying it's not that serious 
you know, 15 people were diagnosed now. Next week, it will just be down to one person. Then even as, as it got more serious, time went on, he would say, uh, yeah, okay, you know, it's pretty bad now, but don't worry, it'll just go away, it'll get better. But one of the things about Trump is you could write a textbook about the different kinds of misinformation and lies he gave forth. If Trump really believed that, then he wasn't lying at all. There is an interview that Woodward of Woodward and Bernstein fame, Bob Woodward, who wrote the book about the Watergate break-in and who also with uh, his partner Bernstein was responsible for Richard Nixon resigning back in the 1970s. But there is an interview that Woodward did with Trump in which Trump says to him, this is really serious. You know, I don't know what we're going to do about it. You know, my luck as president this is now happening, this being COVID-19. So that suggests that he was deliberately lying. But was that a good thing to do or a bad thing to do? One of the problems with social media, as we were just talking about before, is they make it incredibly easy to lie. White lies, lies of omission, lies of commission, because all you have to do to lie is just dash off a couple of things. One of the things that some people have been looking into about lies and about the polarization of our society is that because of the ease of communicating uh, about anything you want on social media, you can put out outrageous statements. People read them very quickly. And what it helps do is get people more angry at their opponents. So if you think about just television as a more traditional medium, on the one hand, you have MSNBC and CNN. On the other hand, you have Fox News. Most of the people who watch Fox News hate MSNBC and CNN because they think they are being unfair to Trump. And most of the people who watch CNN and MSNBC hate Fox News because they think that Fox News is being too good to Trump. Is there a way objectively to tell the difference? Well, again, you know, Fox News did report that Trump won the election, even though he didn't. So objectively, you can look at these things. But it's also true that I tend to watch CNN and MSNBC. I was at a virtual conference at the end of December, and we got into a discussion about some of these things. And someone said to me, you know, can you you're obviously an opponent of Trump. Did Trump do any good things? Can you name even one good thing that Trump did? And I thought for a second, I said, well, I, I really can't think of any. I mean, maybe, you know, he opened up the dialogue with Kim Jong-un in North Korea. That is good, but nothing came of that. And the guy who asked me the question started laughing, saying, see, I'm not surprised. Trump did a lot of good things. You don't even know about those things. By the way, he didn't bother to tell me what those things are. But it is true that I don't know about those things because you're not going to find on MSNBC and CNN any report about anything good that Trump did. Actually, I can't think of one good thing that Trump did. Would you like to know what that is? One good thing. I can't remember her name. He did give a pardon and got this woman released from prison, a woman out in California who would, she did like some very minor thing and the, the crazy legal system out in California, they sentenced her to prison for like 25, 30 years, or even longer than that. And the woman had already spent at least 15 or 20 years in prison. I think Kim Kardashian had taken up her case. She went to see Trump and Trump released this woman from prison. So that's a good thing that Trump did. The only reason I know about it is that MSNBC reported it. But there probably are other good things that Trump did. So what I'm now saying is if we're talking about lies and lies of omission and lies of commission and white lies and all these kinds of lies, 
the media themselves, it's not just individuals like a president lying. It's not just people tweeting, lying in their tweets. It's that the media themselves often lie, lies of omission and even lies of commission. That's why communication ethics and the public sphere is naturally interested in what lying is doing to our society through the media, through public officials, through individuals via tweets and other online systems. One of the things that has clearly happened in journalism, this is something that Andre Mir, M-I-R, has written a really good book about. He calls it post-journalism, is opinions have increasingly replaced facts as what journalists report. Once upon a time, journalism and news media were about reporting facts and you occasionally had an opinion put in there. Now the opinions come first and there are facts, but there are only facts that are used to support the opinion. To give you an example, the New York Times, I can't remember exactly when it was, it was certainly sometime in 2020, published an op-ed by Tom Cotton, C-O-T-T-O-N, who's a conservative Republican senator, who doesn't even support Trump all the time, but it supports Trump sometimes. And the people who talk about the New York Times on television got furious. Why is the New York Times allowing this conservative to put a, you know, his opinion into the New York Times? And this got so bad that the person, the editor, who hired and recruited Cotton to write the opinion, publicly apologized and later resigned. So that gives you an example of how polarized our media have become. And, you know, they would go crazy if someone said to them, you don't publish facts anymore, you just publish opinions. That would be unfair. They do publish facts, but it's the facts are geared towards supporting an opinion rather than basically just presenting the facts as they are. By the way, just to throw another element in here apropos of Trump, how many of you have heard of something called the Trump bump? And it's not a personal thing, it's a media thing. The Trump bump, any of you hear about that? Okay, here in a nutshell, is what the Trump bump was and maybe still is. The older mass media, like the New York Times and even some broadcast media, were losing readers and viewers in 2013, 14, 15. The viewership and readers were gradually ebbing away because they were spending their time on Twitter and social media. Honestly, I haven't picked up a copy of the New York Times in 10 years. My wife subscribes to it because she likes doing the crossword puzzles. Not only that, she likes doing it on paper. So I don't know, go figure. Why can't you do it online? The only time I read the New York Times is if I see an article online, I want to read more about that. But there was a time before Twitter when I would pick up the New York Times every morning. You know, I'd be eating breakfast. I'd look at the Times but I don't do that anymore because I get my information online. So the circulation of the New York Times was dropping for years until Trump. And then after Trump, suddenly the New York Times was reinvigorated. The New York Times now today has greater digital circulation than it ever had when it was a print only publication. And that's an amazing thing. So, What media observers say is that the New York Times benefited from the Trump bump. But the New York Times has that circulation because the people who read the New York Times online, by and large, hate Trump. And they want to read the New York Times because they want that dislike of Trump to be ratified by the New York Times. That's why so many readers complained when the New York Times published the op-ed by Tom Cotton because he was not somebody who was criticizing Trump. 
And, and I think, you know, the, the use of algorithms where an advertiser can take advantage of knowing, okay, I, I want to do a pro this or an anti that ad and, you know, politically. And, and so the social medium can tell you, okay, I'm going to deliver that ad to an audience that is the most likely to act upon it. And again, for those of you who, uh, you know, may not know that much about the history of advertising, which in itself is a huge field, this was always one of the problems of traditional media advertising, and it still is. I mean, if you think about it, you, you see an ad on television, or even a better example, an ad on a billboard. You know, you're driving down up and down the West Side Highway in, in Manhattan, and you see those big ads. They don't know, who, they have no idea who is in the car who is going to see those ads. Their mass media, and so what their philosophy is, is okay, we're going to do an ad, we'll throw it out there, and we, we're just going to hope that it sticks, meaning that it hits enough people that are going to be responsive to the ad that it's worth our while to put the ad up. And that was always the basis of advertising since advertising began way, way, way back in the late 1600s, early 1700s with newspapers, where merchants said, hey, we're going to put an ad in the newspaper. We're going to let the people in this city know that some ships have just landed from the Western Hemisphere and they have all kinds of new goods and services. They didn't know who was going to read those ads. Most people were illiterate then anyway, but they didn't know who was going to be interested in their product. They just figured in general, hey, we'll put the ad out there. Now, because of the targeting, everything has changed. And I'll just you know, tell you an example that sort of speaks to this. One of the things that I do, you know, both for amusement, but it's also part of my work is I'm a science fiction author. I've had a whole bunch of novels published. Sometimes they sell well, sometimes they don't. And one day I had a conversation with the publisher, you know, a pretty big company, Tor, T-O-R Books. I said, hey, I really love your, you know, book. I said, well, thanks a lot. So uh, how about going for a full page ad in the New York Times, a uh, Sunday magazine book review section? I knew he wasn't going to do it. The ads cost about forty or $50,000. He could have said to me, no, I'm not going to do it. I don't think your book's going to sell that much. But instead, he said, those ads, they're hit and miss, you know. Yeah, we put the ad out there. It, it could result in like 5,000 sales it could result in 50 sales. And clearly, you're not going to spend $50,000 for 50 sales. But what he was getting at, the, the president of Tor Books, is exactly what I've just been saying, that traditional mass market advertising had no idea who was going to see that ad. You just paid for the ad, it was put out there, you hope for the best. Facebook and Twitter and these algorithms have dramatically change that. Now, for the first time, you can pinpoint where the ads are going to go. And getting back to Trump, they are, there are an endless series, it seems, of explanations as to how Trump managed to win the electoral vote. He did lose the popular vote, but won the electoral vote in 2016. These range from Jill Stein took away a lot of votes that would have went to Hillary in those Midwestern states. To Hillary, very dislikable person. She got a lot of people who might have voted for the Democratic ticket not to vote that year. I think it's a combination of lots of different reasons. Oh, the Russians somehow hacked the system. There's no proof that that happened. But one thing that there is proof of is how... The Trump campaign, not the Clinton campaign, in 2016, they were the first major political campaign to take advantage of targeted advertising and using Facebook's algorithms. And I think that is going to go down in history as, in many ways, probably the most decisive factor in Trump doing as well as he did in 2016, because those targeted ads on Facebook went to Trump supporters. Not a cent was wasted in the advertising. And maybe the difference between 2016 and 2020 is that the Democrats got savvy about targeted advertising in 2020. The Light on Light Through podcast 
Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of Light On, Light Through. I'll be back here soon with another episode. Could be, again, a political media analysis or a review of a new science fiction series. Who knows? In the meantime, stay safe, stay well, and enjoy. Athens, 2042 AD. She ripped the paper in half, then ripped the halves, then ripped what was left again into bits and pieces of history that could have been. Sierra Waters had read once that, years ago, it was thought that men made love for the thrill, while women made love for the sense of connection it gave them. Curled up with a good book says, Sierra Waters is sexy as hell. You can find out more about The Plot to Save Socrates by Paul Levinson at theplottosavesocrates.com. Paul Levinson still codes about an ancient biotech war raging on in secret for centuries. 